Um, the one thing I would like to say is that I've recently had the great privilege of being appointed to the um, new Science Advisory Council of the Stockholm Environment Institute. So it's a great pleasure to know that um, SEI is involved in YESI, and uh, uh, um, I know some people from SEI York are here today. Um, I will start with something I recently did, which was to go back and reread the Stockholm Declaration. It was published on the 16th of June 1972, so more than 40 years ago, after the Stockholm Environment Conference, the first major conference on the human environment. And I was sort of struck by one of the points, one of the things actually is it's written in beautifully elegant language. And you know, many of our writings today could learn something from it. But the, the basic point made in the Stockholm Declaration, and I quote, was that a point has been reached in history when we must shape our actions with a more prudent care for their environmental consequences. So it's a rather beautiful understatement uh, reflecting the mounting concern about environment in the late 1960s and early 1970s. So just a little bit of reflection on, on where I come from in all of this, because I actually went to university in 1972 I went to UEA to read environmental sciences, which was then a, a new and innovative, very exciting sort of degree. Um, I was, of course, you know, carried along in that wave of enthusiasm for all things environmental. So I started my education, undergraduate education, in the year of the Stockholm Environment Conference, and indeed the year in which I believe both limits to growth and the uh, famous blueprint for survival were published. And ever since then, I've been interested in my academic life and more generally in the evolution of environmental concerns and environmental politics and policies since their origins, at least in the sense of modern environmentalism, at that time around about the turn of the 60s, 70s decades. And in, inevitably then, I've also become interested in the incredibly complex and invariably contested nature of environmental so-called, or, or let me say, of the phenomena that we have come to define as environmental problems. And the processes by which we do that are themselves interesting. And then all, also, for me inevitably, I've been drawn to uh, be very interested in the relations in this field among science and politics and policy making. Because every issue that I've ever done my own research on or been interested in more generally seems to have involved a really interesting, important, and often fraught set of relations among science policy making and politics. I've also had a bit of experience of um, knowledge and policy and politics interacting. I was a member for 10 years of the Royal Commission on Environmental <coughs> Pollution, now sadly demised. Um, and uh, I currently sit on the Science Advisory Group of, of the Royal Society. So from both my own work, my own research, which has dealt with various uh, environmental issues, and that experience, my interest in this relationship among science policy and politics has been deepened, and it's that that I really want to talk about today. So I, I'd like to address uh, three questions, I suppose. In the context of the complexity of environmental issues and challenges, what do we expect of environmental science, and perhaps science more generally? I use the term we there to mean, I suppose, we as modern societies. I'm always very nervous about using we, and I'm was uncomfortable about the use of the term, especially when it's associated with the word must, as in, we must do this, we must do that. 
because it's actually very difficult for anyone to speak for a we. And I, that's why I'm sort of saying I'm rather boldly doing it on the behalf of modern societies, which, of course, I have absolutely no right to do. None of us has the right to talk about we as in the world. I mean, sometimes we talk we as in scientists. I don't know. It's a word that always has meaning, usually hidden. Um, but I'm going to break all my own rules and use it because it's actually incredibly difficult to give a talk without doing it. Um, so second question then is, are the expectations of science realistic? Are they borne out in what we see? We, well, I've done it straight away, in what is seen in practice? And then third question, what should the expectations be if science and I suppose I'm going to be talking mainly about environmental science, is to occupy what Barack Obama in his first presidential address in 2008 referred to as the rightful place of science in modern democratic societies. Um, like Mike, I'm going to make some reference to uh, Johann's... Uh, I wasn't here, I'm afraid, for the presentation but um, I, I know the work quite well. I'm going to make some reference to Johan Rockström and his colleagues' work on planetary boundaries. It's almost uh, unavoidable now. It's very difficult not to bring that in in some way. But I just at this stage want to make two important distinctions referring to that work. One is what the planetary boundaries paper in Nature in 2009 referred to as the critical thresholds. That is the essential biophysical systems and processes which, according to the arguments in the paper, if pushed beyond certain tipping points, might, as it were, move us out of the Holocene into a, an era that would be much less comfortable for human existence. And you will remember that the paper identified 11 of those critical thresholds. But rather separately from that, it identifies or tries to define and innovatively tries to quantify certain boundaries <coughs> which are rather different in that they are the precautionary thresholds are drawn outside the critical thresholds beyond which modification of Earth systems should not go if we are to, with all our uncertainties, avoid getting too close to the critical thresholds. So that is quite an interesting distinction. And nine such boundaries, again, as everyone will know, were identified in that paper. And it was those boundaries drawn, as it were, outside the quote unquote real critical thresholds, which the paper argues would constitute the safe operating space within which human ends might be pursued. Okay, uh, that's introduction. Let me start then with the question, what do we as modern societies expect of science, perhaps environmental science specifically? And certainly when I went to UEA in 1972, full of um, hopes and expectations, a huge amount was expected of environmental science. Um, the newly recognized set of problems, the environmental problems uh, that were emergent then, um, in a sense, stimulated the very existence of courses like the one I took, environmental sciences. And it was thought that bringing together different perspectives, different disciplinary perspectives to bear on the emergent problems would lead to their resolution and essentially make the world a better place. Well, certainly we expect environmental science, as we expect all science, to uh, produce knowledge, um, truths, if you like, about the world, but knowledge and over that period, there has been an enormously, <coughs> impressively, fantastically increased body of knowledge about Earth and environmental systems. Understandings of those systems have grown, increased, 
enormously. Sometimes the knowledge simply indicates how much there is still to know, but it nevertheless is a very impressive increase in knowledge. And just as an aside, I note that that knowledge, of course, isn't purely for instrumental reasons. Much of what's been learned about Earth and environmental systems over the past half a century surely can do no less than make us appreciative of the world that we live in and indeed um, has quite a humbling effect, I think, or should do on humanity uh, in making people perhaps reflect on their place within a wider system. Uh, we also, I think, expect science to improve knowledge about the impacts of human action within those systems, whether those human actions are harmful ones or whether they are the ameliorative actions to try to mop up after the harmful ones. We, uh, there's a hope that science will improve our understandings of how those impacts actually take place. Science is expected to have predictive capacities, of course. And then moving away perhaps from some of those more traditional, normal expectations of science, science is also expected to exercise a certain detachment from politics, from the rather dirty world of politics, and I'll come back to that issue later. But at the same time, scientists are expected, at least some of them are expected, to give good counsel, to give dispassionate guidance for those who are charged with making policies and difficult decisions. Now let me return briefly to the Planetary Boundaries paper to illustrate some of those expectations. So what is extremely interesting about that paper, for me anyway, in terms of what I'm interested in, is that for, for Johann Rockström and his colleagues, it is science that will define the critical Earth system processes that are discussed in the paper. And as Johann himself put it in the lively debate that took place on the Nature website after publication of the paper, <laughs> Science can define those critical Earth systems, quote, irrespective of our human impacts on the planet. In other words, those critical systems are real characteristics of nature, waiting to be apprehended by environmental and Earth system scientists uh, and providing a sort of backdrop then for future action. Interestingly then, the paper argues that values and subjectivities, otherwise known as politics, will then, then, afterwards, come into deciding how close to the critical thresholds human societies ought to go. In other words, the boundaries, the setting of the boundaries, may involve judgments, may involve politics but the defining of the critical thresholds is outside the realm of politics, according to the Planetary Boundaries paper. So it's a rather nice illustration, I think, of the notion that science will improve knowledge, will have predictive capacities, will be detached from a political sphere, but will give good counsel to those who have to make the difficult decisions. Okay, the realities. Let me start this section by saying that a great deal has been achieved. I, I think that's really difficult to deny over half a century in both science and policy making in relation to environmental issues. And I would add that many of the advances that have been made in the world of policy making at all levels, I think could not plausibly have been made without some of the scientific basis and the scientific evidence. 
So let's not forget those achievements. And I say it also as a little bit of a, a disclaimer because some of the things I'm now going to argue might be misinterpreted to mean that science doesn't have a critical role in these issues. In spite of the achievements, though, and I guess this has been the subject of many of the presentations and discussions over the last couple of days, environmental degradation persists and indeed accelerates. And much of the evidence for that was uh, presented in Georgina's lecture and in other papers yesterday. Yes, there is some hope, but it's a little bit tiny in relation to the scale of the problems. And not just the scale of the problems, but the rapidity with which some of the changes are taking place. Um, and as the Planetary Boundaries paper puts it, um, Several of the boundaries are already breached, including that related to climate, including that related to biodiversity, the latter breached by an order of magnitude, according to the estimates in the paper. There's one more boundary that's breached. I can't quite remember which one it is at the moment. I'm also not quite sure what it means. I still go to work each day. Um, so I think there's some interesting thought. What does it mean when, when, when these boundaries are breached? But nevertheless, the message is there. The problems aren't getting a lot better in spite of all the achievements. The policy achievements have been phenomenal. In 1972, people were still sort of paddling around in huge swathes of sewage in British estuaries. It was, an, it was a breach of the Official Secrets Act to reveal what was being discharged into rivers and estuaries. You know, some of the things that have come to pass since then would have seemed unthinkable. Just as another aside, though, it seems to me that not only the scale, but actually the nature of the issues that we've come to define as environmental problems has changed quite subtly. And I haven't got time to go into that, but I would propose that most of the problems of the 1960s and the 1970s were the crude externalities of production that could actually be controlled relatively easily. Not without blood on the carpet, as we saw in the ensuing decades, but nevertheless relatively easily. And that the sorts of issues that we now confront are much more deeply embedded in people's lifestyles and aspirations and are probably much, much more difficult to confront in any sort of standard way. But that's a sort of aside. The realities uh, are, in relation to questions about science, politics and policy making, and again they've been coming out over the last <coughs> couple of days, I think my colleague Bill Sutherland in Cambridge puts it rather nicely when he says that it, there's a perception amongst ecologists that policies are often developed without sound evidence derived from research. I think worse. One can be much blunter than that and say that political actors at all levels of governance often make choices in spite of scientific evidence and advice. Uh, I guess um, Professor Nutt uh, resigned <coughs> partly for those sorts of reasons. Now, again, it has to be said that scientific advice sometimes works very well. And I haven't got time to go into that. I've been doing an extended study of the advice of the Royal Commission over 41 years and looking at the circumstances in which it worked and the circumstances in which it bombed. <coughs> And there are lots of interesting things to say about that. But I, at, for the purposes of today's talk, I'm more interested in what happens when scientific advice and knowledge doesn't seem to be taken into account, especially and indeed invariably when we're dealing with controversial, <laughs> contested issues. What then happens, the reality then, is frustration and disappointment among both scientists and political actors or other political actors alike. Sometimes eruptions of 
really quite deep controversy, uh, very fraught relations among experts, policy makers, and indeed publics, the nut controversy, climate gate, and so on. As Georgina put it last night, science seems to be running ahead of governance systems. And as uh, John Lawton put it in his address to the British Ecological Society a few years ago, a rather plaintive plea, why does it seem so difficult to get politicians and policymakers to adopt what to us are the obvious steps to protect the natural environment? So I take up that question in the context of um, contested, controversial environmental problems, why are our expectations of science in this respect so difficult to realise? Okay, I have to go fast now and do great violence to some very <coughs> complex concepts, so forgive me. But let me, so first, first, in environmental systems, obviously, and therefore in environmental controversies, there are nearly always uncertainties, that's a given, deep uncertainties of the kind that might not necessarily be resolved by further research, and indeed huge swathes of ignorance. In the Planetary Boundaries paper, Johan Rockström and his colleagues fully acknowledge that the parameters used in characterising critical thresholds and the values attached to boundaries were little more than, and I quote, best guesses, best estimates, sorry. Second, often in environmental controversies, there are very high political and economic stakes. And it's that combination that, if you like, toxic, but also fascinating and necessary combination <coughs> of great and deep uncertainties and very high stakes that makes the sort of science and its relations with politics in this field very different, very distinctive. It's what Sheila Jasanoff um, in Harvard calls regulatory science and what Silvio Fontovitz and Jerry Rovetz have famously called post-normal science. Third, and perhaps more importantly, and connecting a bit with Mike's talk here. Underlying environmental controversies are often very deep differences in values and beliefs. In other words, the protagonists in controversies often hold very different world views. For example, on what human relations with non-human non nature ought to entail? What ought to be those relations? Should they be relations of commodification or should they be relations of respect and obligation? Very different worldviews based on fundamentally different moral frameworks. But different worldviews, in other words, different answers to Ulrich Beck's question how do we wish to live? I think that the uh, deep controversy over GM, for example, wasn't about or wasn't really about misled public perceptions of risk, but was actually about fundamentally different world views about agricultural and social futures. And that's much more difficult to, to actually deal with in, in political systems. A couple of observations then. We are dealing not just with uncertainties, but with ambiguities. Ambiguities in the sense that Andrew Sterling and others have used to mean that people don't even agree on what the problem is, let alone on what the solutions might be. There are different definitions of the problem. And furthermore, these different worldviews don't divide neatly along all our comfortable normal dichotomies. They d five minutes, yes, I'll do it in that just about. They don't <coughs> divide, for example, along the rather hackneyed dichotomy of experts and lay publics. They don't divide along the lines of natural and social sciences. They don't even divide 
along the line, if it's a line, between science and politics. In different groups on every, in every, of every one of these deep controversies, you find intelligent people of goodwill on each side of that controversy. <coughs> Journalists, politicians, scientists, non-scientists. Never mind, you know, yes, lay publics as well, but you don't have to use that divide at all. And um, the implication then is that some of those issues cannot be settled by science. They are not fundamentally scientific in uh, nature. And then a final point about that, those ambiguities become deeply intertwined with the scientific uncertainties themselves. And they become very difficult to tease apart. Okay, fourth point, fourth reason why our expectations are sometimes confounded even when there is scientific consensus, and usually there is not, but even when there is, politics is a means of negotiating the diversity, the great diversity of human ends. In fact, it's probably the best means of negotiating different human ends. The other means that have been tried from time to time are not very pleasant. So we should never, ever get ourselves into a situation where we say, we as society or we as researchers say, we know what to do, politics is the problem. Politics is not a problem. It is the way that we actually survive without fighting each other. So it's actually rather good. And then, of course, policy-making processes are infused with politics. They involve interests, bargaining, and power. And so, inevitably, unavoidably, and probably rightly, political actions are underdetermined by the science. Always. They are going to be. And one might say that is right and proper in democracies, but it is also something that is often seen as problematic. And like Mike, I've been observing metaphors, some very interesting metaphors about relations between science and politics. We talk about the science policy interface. That has them as spheres that actually come together. That's quite good. Okay, sometimes we talk about bridging science and politics, so they're over here and you walk on one of those very dodgy little bridges in between. Um, the metaphors are never innocent, certainly, as Mike put it. It's not an issue of communication, or not only an issue of communication. Sometimes the solution seems to be a bit, bit like the caricature of the English man abroad, you know. If people don't understand you, you say it a bit louder, or even with a megaphone, and then, or very slowly and very clearly, and then they might get it. Communication is important, of course. Don't misunderstand me. What is also extremely interesting here is that one response to the apparent difficulties of, of you know, that relationship between science and politics is um, to strive even harder to separate facts and values. So Pearl Nurse, when incoming president of the Royal Society in a, a very interesting Horizon program, um, said, what is really required is a focus on the science, keeping the politics and keeping the ideologies out of the way. So if I may have a couple more minutes. Nurse's project of doing that, which is shared by very many others, I would argue is unattainable in relation to the major environmental challenges of the 21st century. Because, as um, the sociologist Ezrahi put it beautifully in 1980, when scientific uncertainties combine with, I quote, unsettled, ambiguous, or contradictory human ends, science and politics <coughs> interpenetrate. 
Sheila Jasanoff calls it co-production. In most of the issues that we grapple with, the science and the politics are inevitably co-produced. Now, I was going to say a little bit more about the planetary boundaries. Perhaps it'll come up in questions. Let me make some con concluding points instead. What should we then expect of science in the complex and highly charged issues of environmental sustainability? Well, first, undoubtedly, I would defend this to the end, it has a critically important role. Second, the relations of science to environmental governance should, in my view anyway, be characterised not by increasingly striving for the separation of facts and values, but by a recognition that they are inevitably tangled up together, and therefore by honesty and mutual understanding of science and politics, recognising the limitations of science, but also recognising the limited degrees of freedom in politics and policy making. It's one of my ambitions for a politician being interviewed by John Humphreys or whoever on the Today programme about some environmental science controversy to hear a politician say, I want to hear what the scientists say on this, but I'm not going to take any notice whatsoever because there's only one thing I can do politically and it's going to be X. And I would value that because that would be honest instead of saying we have to wait for the independent science and then cherry picking or using that science strategically to legitimise some political course of action. The politics is perfectly legitimate and I'd like to hear that defended too. Thirdly, and I've only got one more of these, um, I think there simply has to be an acceptance of the hybrid character of science and politics, as again, as Sheila Jasanoff puts it, and therefore of not only the impossibility, but actually the undesirability of keeping the politics out of science. Um, nature apparently agrees with me, since in an editorial uh, on the 7th of March last year, uh, wrote, science can never come before politics. And finally then, it seems to me that scientists and policy makers need to work constructively together to arrive at what Jasanoff calls serviceable truths, or actually at what Georgina, as Georgina put it last night, to do things when we know enough to make a sensible decision. And if I might finish instead with the words, again, of the Stockholm Declaration, um, perhaps our need is to, and I quote, adopt an enthusiastic but calm state of mind and commit ourselves to intense but orderly work. And I'm sure that's what Yessi is going to do.